Hi, I'm Maddie Sloan and welcome to season five of Snap Happy, the photography show. We have some great guests, heaps of tips and some amazing locations for you. Once again, Darren Leal is taking us on the road with World Photo Adventures. Let's join him now in Argentina. Here we are in Patagonia, one of the greatest places on our planet, a photographer's dream. I've been coming here to Patagonia for 30 years now, and for me, it's a really special part of the world. I hope you enjoy what you're about to see. About 12 years ago, a new location was found to photograph, and my early groups that I took there, we were the only photographers there. Today, it gets a little bit busier, so it's called the canyon. When we arrived this morning, we found that the cloud was not in our favour, but very quickly it changed, and that's typical Patagonia. You never know, so you could wake up, it could be snowing, a little bit of rain, don't sit in your hotel, you get out every time, every morning, because you're guaranteed it's gonna change very quickly, and if you're very, very lucky, you'll get that special, special sunrise. So we've had a fantastic shoot this morning and we're just driving back to our accommodation. Stopped at a little lookout and I, I saw this puddle of water here, literally a big puddle of water. And I said to the guys, hey, let's have a look at it for reflections. So one of the cool techniques we have today for this type of photography is our screen. So we can actually flip the screen, rotate it to work so that the camera comes down to a particular angle as low as possible and I can still see very clearly what I'm trying to photograph. I don't do anything special for the settings, aperture priority, f11, it's a landscape so I try and optimise my depth of field uh, and that's about it. So you come to Patagonia for one reason, fantastic landscapes when in actual fact there's some beautiful animals here too. Yesterday driving in from El Calafati to Chelten, which is only a half day drive, we first of all came across a condor. So condors used to be rare, nowadays they're becoming more common and uh, photographically stunning birds. So they're the biggest uh, vulture that you'll find in this part of the world. Also yesterday we came across a beautiful grey fox. Now this fox, he's, he's small for a fox, but he was, he's quite approachable and uh, allowed us to use our long telephoto lens and we've got beautiful portraits, drop backgrounds out, that type of thing. So we were shooting landscapes at the time, but hey, there's a fox, let's get that as well. I wouldn't come to Patagonia just for landscapes, I'd definitely come for the condors and all these other great animals that you can find in this beautiful part of the world. We're in Patagonia at a special time of the year. It's autumn, we've got four colours occurring. Now, for me, as a photographer, that really gets me excited because I can photograph the fagus trees here from backlit leaves right through to the grand landscape and in between. My key goal uh, is to help photographers get really good photographs under these conditions. And full colour isn't always as simple as it seems. So one of the key things you'd like to get with full colour is backlighting. And that's the special part. If you shoot with reflected light, it's not going to look quite as colourful. But if you can get the sun in the right direction, backlighting occurring, it can be a very, very cool result. One of the techniques I love to use out in the field um, is literally with a general purpose lens or a macro lens ideally. Um, and this little guy's called the Cube. And it's a torch, very small but very powerful. And it allows me to do special techniques I used to use a flash for. I actually put this light underneath the leaves. I can then set up my camera. Um, again, simple techniques, aperture priority. Usually I up the ISO a little, like 800 or something like that, and 5.6. I've been to this location many times and this is probably the best I've ever seen it. So again, we're in the four colour period, but when you come to these places, you can't always guarantee that you'll get the best colour. Four colours really only happens for about two to three weeks of the year. So right now, um, the group's out there taking photographs, optimising slower shutter speeds and that'll of course give that milky water look. You don't always want that though, so sometimes you'll close your aperture down, use a neutral density filter, that'll give you your long shutter speed. Other times though, take off the neutral density uh, and get a faster shutter speed. You'll get a different look. 
I've picked this spot here because I feel it gives a three-dimensional look to my photographic opportunity. So I've got the waterfall, I've got mid-ground, and I've got foreground. And the foreground here is this beautiful rock with the swirling water going around it. So rather than a straight, flat waterfall look, I'm trying to get a dimensional look to the final result. Next episode, we continue our adventures through Patagonia. If you want to go on your own photo adventure, why not join us? Welcome to Bruni Island, an amazing location off the southeast coast of Tasmania. If you love nature, add this place to your bucket list now. The island boasts stunning clifftop views, long sandy beaches, and an abundance of rare and endangered plant and wildlife species. We're here to spend a few days with a group of amazing photographers. Throughout the series, we'll get to know them as they share some tips on a variety of photographic genres. Let's go meet the crew. Kevin, this place is absolutely wild. Where are we and what are we doing here? We're in Bruni <laughs> Island, an island off the south of Tasmania. It's wild, it's rugged, but that makes for the best photographs, especially in this sort of weather when you've got a little bit of rain, the mood of the light just changes all the time. We're here for a workshop, I believe. Correct. With four great photographers that love Fujifilm cameras because they're really an extension of you. Richard Bennett, 13 books under his belt. Amazing. 46th year of shooting the Sydney Hobart. Beauty with Richard, he actually lives on Bruni Island, so you're seeing the best of Bruni Island from a photographer's perspective. Phil Caravita, another Tasmanian. Shot weddings, family portraits, commercial work and reinvented himself in his business to create these amazing books for business around Tasmania. Ian Vanderbilt, commercial photographer from Melbourne, shooting very high-end commercial. And on top of that, you've got Bruce Pottinger. There's nothing that Bruce doesn't know about photography. So nearly 200 years of experience in photography. Great, Kevin, let's get out there and explore. Let's go. We've got a great team and we cover all genres of photography from landscape for cooking, to nature, to total creative. The best thing about this is that you get a bunch of people together, you take them to an awesome location, and then when you get back and you process the pictures, everyone's got a different image. And that's what photography is all about. The sun strikes the landscape at a low angle, which means that we have beautiful light in Tasmania. You'd book a trip like this to really build on your passion for photography. Come away with like-minded people, photographing some great locations, some great scenery, some wildlife, but build on that passion and learn to love your photography even more. One of the classic locations here is called The Neck. It's a narrow strip of land that separates north and south of Bruni Island. Ian Vanderwalt has won numerous accolades for his landscape photography, and he joins us now. Well, here we are at The Neck on Bruni Island. We had every intention of doing a long exposure demonstration, but with long exposures, everything needs to be held really still and vibration free. It's a little less windy down below, but as we've gotten up here to near the top, we can see that there is no way we're going to be able to keep this camera still. So we're going to head off and see if we can find an area that's a little more sheltered, and perhaps we can do something there. Well, Ian, that didn't go to plan. No, who would have thought? 100 kilometre hour winds. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> You're well known for your long exposure photography. Tell us about that. Well, look, I got into long exposure. I'm a commercial photographer by trade, so I spend the week photographing things for other people. And uh, it was just a way of getting out there and slowing everything down and doing something for me. But I found the only time I could shoot was at the end of the day and at night time. So by default, they became long exposures. So. Yeah, but I enjoy it. It's just a way of relaxing at the end of the day. Ian, obviously the neck was a no-go today. Should we try another location instead? Absolutely. We're on the other side of the island now to a more sheltered place over at Resolution Creek. We're hoping it's a little bit better here. We're still battling some weather conditions, but we'll give it a go and see what we can get. What I'm looking for with a long exposure is to get some texture and some mood in the shot. So it's quite a grey day today, unfortunately, but we've got some cloud. So a little bit of white cloud moving through the frame will actually give us a nice streak of light. If we just took a normal short exposure, we'd just have a grey, boring sky. So it just enables us to get some more drama, some more mood and some more atmosphere into the scene. I'm currently using a three-stop neutral density filter. A neutral density filter is effectively like a pair of sunglasses for your camera lens. I take a light reading and then I work out from there how long I would like my exposure to be and what filter I require. 
There's also some really handy smartphone apps that can help you determine your exposure with a neutral density filter. You simply key in the exposure that you've determined without a filter, dial in the appropriate filter and it will give you the correct exposure time for that filter. So you can work out very, very quickly what exposure you're going to achieve. You know, the old saying is, if you don't succeed, try again, and that's exactly what we've done here this morning. We could have slept in nice and cosy, but despite the rain and the winds, we got out of bed, and some of my best shots have, have come out of situations like this, so it's always worth the effort to get out and give it a go. In later episodes, we look forward to bringing you more from Bruny Island and all the great diversity it has to offer. Do you need some help processing your photos? Well, you're in luck. Peter Eastway is taking us to a high mountain sheep station in New Zealand to bring us a new series of post-production tips. Some people believe that landscape photography is all about using a wide angle lens so that you can fit everything in. And that's true, some landscapes look fantastic that way but I'm going to suggest that you pull out a telephoto lens. When we look at a landscape, we often see little bits which are more interesting than the rest, and I think that's where the telephoto lens comes in, because we can zoom in on just that little area that looks really cool. So we're looking for shapes, we're looking for pattern, and when you come to a huge landscape like Middlehurst here, there's lots of mountains, lots of scenes in the distance that can really make great semi-abstract images. The other thing that landscape photographers love is the early morning and the late afternoon light. Why? Because the light skims across the ground, it gives you a beautiful side lighting. But in the mountains, like here in Middlehurst, any time of the day creates side lighting. There's always a mountain face that's angled to the light and looks fantastic. And just look at what we've got here. I'm going to get a few photos and then we're back to the homestead to see how all this comes together in post-production. There's nothing better than coming back down to the homestead after a shoot, sitting down at the window, looking at the view, opening up Adobe Lightroom on my Wacom Mobile Studio Pro, and I am in post-production heaven. I've picked one of the photos that we took. It might be my Sarah Lee moment, you might say, where I've got layer upon layer of mountain range. We've got dark, light, dark, and that's what I want to enhance. My first step in Lightroom is just to go through the basic panel and ensure that my colour and exposure is exactly right. So, first step, I'll grab the white balance selector. I'm going to select in a number of different areas and just see what happens as I do it. And I pick a colour balance that makes me happy. It doesn't have to be super accurate, I just want it to look good. And we'll come to exposure. Looking at the image, I could possibly lighten up a little bit, but I don't want to lighten it up too much because I don't want to lose the detail in the snow. So lightening that up a, a skerrick, I'd sit back and I'd say, I'm happy with that as a starting point. One of my favourite tools in Lightroom is the adjustment brush, and we'll be using that quite a lot. Now, I specifically want to darken down that back jagged mountain range. I want it to look ominous. And when I'm selecting areas, rather than doing a very precise selection, I'm using a large brush with a big feather, and it makes it hard for people to see where I've been working. And as you'll see, that's starting to give it that really moody, stormy look. Now, for the final piece, I want to bring out the texture in that snow. So we're going to add another adjustment brush, and I'm going to just paint over that middle range there. And there's a new tool down here in Adobe Lightroom Texture. I'm just going to move that to the right a little bit, and you'll watch that the texture in that snow just starts to pop up. And what I've got is a really moody, emotional, telephoto landscape shot something that I would never capture with a wide-angle lens. I believe photography is two steps, capture and then post-production. I'm Peter Eastway. Camera Electronic is a photography mecca for those who live on the west coast of Australia. They have two stores here in Perth and an online presence that reaches right across the country. I had a chat with the owners to find out more. So if Camera Electronic is more than just a camera store, what makes it different? Uh, we just love photography, like it is our tagline, but we just do workshops and talks and as much as selling cameras is important, uh, we want to be able to be part of all the camera clubs, all the camera enthusiasts and just share our knowledge. Our staff as well, they're great, our customers, our staff, our suppliers and supporters, we all just love photography and love the industry and just passionate about image making. So the store has quite a long history, where did it all start? 
Dad started from home, buying and selling cameras and uh, buying broken ones, fixing them and then selling them, trying to make a little bit of profit. We still keep a uh, full-time technician upstairs. Repairs and making sure your gear is in tip-top shape is still really important to us. Amazing. It's so great to see the family business is still growing. What other services do you guys provide? We do rentals, so for all sorts of stills and video gear and everything for image making, a lot of lighting. We started another business called Troop Photography Workshops. Around Rottnest Island, we took a, a speedboat with 20 customers around the island, just shooting, having fun, finding dolphins. So we like being part of photography, not just selling cameras. That's uh, probably something really different. So you're obviously avid and passionate photographers yourselves. How else do you engage in the photography community? Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> in WA, there's WAPF, West Australian Photographic Federation, that runs all the camera clubs. Even if a camera club's got eight people, if they're having a little talk or a workshop, we'll actually go out there and help them. There's AIPP as well. We're involved sponsoring them on a national and a state level, so we go to most of their things around the country. We've even got our own uh, radio show just giving advice about photography every couple of weeks on uh, 6PR. We even ran our own photography convention expo last weekend, which was huge. There's nothing like it in Australia. We take people through the photographic journey, so maybe they start off with their smartphone or a point and shoot, and then when they want to get a bit more out of it, they'll come and do a course, learn something more, go into a mirrorless SLR or, or a high-level compact and go through the journey with them. So I feel like the service you guys offer here is a very holistic experience and a lot of a community vibe, I would say. Tell us about that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because we, we take you through every part of the journey. If you've dropped your camera and that's your heart and soul and you've dropped it, we're going to take care of you, you can get it repaired, we'll get you another camera so you can you know, keep shooting because the worst thing is that you're out there with no camera and you can't take photos. And yeah, a lot of fun try before you buy events where you get to actually shoot and use the gear. We recently did a shoot at ice hockey training and had about 80 customers come along with us and lots of create different shooting experiences for people. And, and we connect with our pro customers, so if you're a professional photographer, we'll run training workshops with the pros. So you hear from the guys that are out there earning their living from photography we help uh, them share their knowledge with us and our clients and we do the same back and forth. Beautiful. Well, thanks so much, boys. Stay tuned because in the coming weeks, we'll be out on the road with the Frank Brothers, road testing some gear and learning some handy tips. At Snap Happy, we love to be creative and take photos, but we also love to print our photos. I'm sure you'll agree that it's one of the best ways to share them with family and friends. Today we visit Memento, their mission to print your priceless photo memories in beautiful handcrafted photo books and photo products for your timeless enjoyment. Well, sounds like they're on the same page as us. Let's go meet the company founders. Well, Jeff, Libby, welcome to Snap Happy. Where did the idea come from? Well, we've always loved travel and photography and in the early 2000s, we bought our new three megapixel digital camera and we're very excited. We went on the road with it and while we traveled, we thought, how can we reinvent how we print our photos? Our camera experience has been reinvented, but we're still printing these six by four inch photos. Memento was born. So what products do you produce here at Memento HQ? So we produce premium photo books. We've got a range of different sizes, papers, cover materials to suit all kinds of projects. And we also produce custom photo stationery. So we've got diaries, calendars, greeting cards and notebooks and you can put your images on the front or inside. Well, it seems like you've covered it all. So seeing as though we're here at the headquarters, shall we have a look around? Let's, Let's do go. That. Well, this is the backbone of our business. This printer does most of our products. Unlike many of our competitors, we run it in six colours, not four colours, which means that with the light cyan and light magenta, we get nicer highlights, wider colour gamut and uh, a great print result. Every sheet that comes off this printer has the quality of a traditional offset printer, yet it's able to make every sheet different. And that it really means that our business is possible. Without this, we couldn't do it. After all the pages are printed, they come out here and every single page is checked by a human being, by our quality assurance staff, because we want to produce the best quality photo books. If they're not happy with any of the pages, if there's a print issue, they'll pull it out and then we'll reprint it before we send it to bind. So what happens here, guys? Um, well, this is where the book comes together. We're now going to cut them down to size and sew them up and that's something that's unique to our business is that we actually sew every book that we make. We don't use a glue-only binding. And Libby mentioned before, when we were chatting, that you actually used to hand sew the books. We did indeed. When we first started off, the team literally had to sew the books together with needle and thread and make a nice tight binding. That is attention to detail. It is. So after the book stitch, what's next? We next make the case, and that's the bit that goes round the outside of the book. 
The guys will put glue on the back of the chosen cloth, and we've got many to choose from. We use three millimetre boards, so it's a nice, thick, strong board to give that premium feel. And once they've glued the cloth, they'll put the boards down and then press the edges to give a nice, sharp feeling. Amazing. And then what about the embossing? On the website, when you order, we will take the letters that you'd like embossed and then the team will line it up literally with old-fashioned brass type pieces, heat it up to uh, the right temperature, and then they'll push it into the front of the book manually. Beautiful. We've got nine different sizes in our photo books, and they're all based on an A5, A4, and A3 spec, and we have them in the landscape, portrait, or square orientation, and they can suit different kinds of projects and sizes, like this little one here, is a nice size. Oh, it's a cute one. Yeah, for a baby book or a brag book that you might want to carry around with Definitely. you. Definitely. We've got our four different paper stocks here. Mm -hmm. They're all premium papers. We've got a satin, a lay flat luster, a luster that isn't lay flat, and we also have an eggshell, Beautiful. which is my favourite. My favourite too. It's very like art stock. It's got a nice texture to it. With the lay flat luster, however, it really does justice for images that span across mm -hmm. two pages, as you can see here. So everything sits perfectly flat. Over here we've got two different dust jackets. So you can print a printed cover with us or you can use material. You can get a gloss finish or a matte finish. And if you feel that... It is nice, isn't it? It's nice and velvety. It's silky. It yeah. It's beautiful. So what is it that makes Memento different? Well, we're Australian made and Australian owned and we've got our uh, production facility right here in Sydney where all our books and other products are made. And quality, I think. We pride ourselves on the quality of our products. So one last question. How difficult is it to produce a photo book? It's not difficult. It's very easy. The software can do all the work for you. You just need to point towards the folder where your photos are or you can have fun laying it out yourself. I've had a great day touring the facilities here at Memento and coming up in this season of Snap Happy, Libby is going to take us through the process of producing your own photo book. I'm really excited to find out more. Thanks for joining us on Snap Happy. If you'd like to join our community, head on over to snaphappytv.com. There you'll find exclusive content, competitions and special offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show.